Hallelujah. Our God and our Father, we come to you because you have made a way for us through the shed blood of Jesus. We enter into the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And because you have invited us to come, we come. We come to adore you. We come to be taught. We come to recognize and confess our utter feebleness without you. We don't live without you. You are our life. So I pray this morning, oh God, that your mighty word will prevail and that hard hearts, obstinate, rebellious spirits will not be able to stand in front of your mighty word, break down every barrier, crush every hardness. In Jesus' name, we ask that devils and demons and evil spirits not be allowed to get near this place as your word is being sown. I ask it in the name of Jesus, save somebody today. Uplift your body today. Let us remember we are not of this world. You are coming soon. Even so, come Lord Jesus. We all pray it. Hallelujah. And amen. And I'd like for us to read together before you're seated. Uh, Jonah. We'll go to chapter five, 3 and we'll begin together to read in verse 5. Brothers, sisters, this is the word of the Lord. When every other mouth is stopped, his mouth will still be speaking truth. This is the word of the Lord. Join me, please. So the people of Nineveh, that's not it. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. Thank you for being seated. Everybody knows the part about Jonah being swallowed by a great fish and vomited out on the seashore. And in his, uh, his reluctance, even, even his disdain for the Ninevites, he learned his lesson that when God tells you to do something, you do it. And God had commanded to Jonah that he go into the city of Nineveh the Bible says it was a, a three-day walk. It's about 68 miles in circumference. It's a big city. And he's to go into the city and start crying out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, can you imagine walking into a major metropolitan area, walking through the first gate and you begin to cry out, this city is going to be destroyed. And you know that not more than 500 people would hear it at one time, but 120,000 people somehow got this word, heard this warning from this prophet. And the Bible says the people believed God. 
Now, this is a godless people. But they believed God. I am shocked to read that it didn't say they believed Jonah. It said they believed God because Jonah had so learned his lesson and was so filled with this message that when he spoke it, even in his own reluctance, The Spirit of God came out of his mouth and the people believed God. And they said, let's proclaim a fast. And they put on sackcloth, which is really rough, irritating goat's hair. And it was a sign of mourning and brokenness and heartache. And when they put on the sackcloth, they began to cry out to God. Mercy from God. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh. He arose from his throne and laid aside his robe and he covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. That was the way they showed that they were heartbroken and horrified about anything. Sackcloth and ashes and that went from the people to the throne and the king was so unnerved by all of this that he made a decree and he said nobody can eat not even the animals no water no food let man and beast he said if you've got animals find some sackcloth and go put it on top of your animals be covered with it man and beast the bible says he commanded them to cry mightily to god cry mightily Do you hear the import of that that command? Cry mightily. Don't meditate. Don't breathe a prayer. Don't just sit and wait in God's presence. This is desperate. We've got to cry and cry mightily. Everybody, every man of the house, every woman, all the children. And I repeat, from the throne to the streets, The command was cry mightily unto God and let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Stop doing what you were doing. Discontinue your sin. Get it out of your heart. Get it off your hands. Cry mightily that God will have mercy on us, but he won't do it until he sees that we are willing to, to stop doing the things that have broken his heart and even made him angry. Who can tell if God will turn? He didn't know. But who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Here's the king. He believed God. He knew God was going to destroy the whole city and all the people in it. And he said, but if we do all we can if we cry mightily, if we find ourselves mourning in sackcloth and ashes, if he sees the whole city broken and repenting, even the animals made to bow in the presence of God, then maybe God will turn and relent. Maybe he will turn his fierce anger that we may not perish. Look at this. Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. Their testimony was, maybe if we turn, he'll turn. Maybe if we'll do something drastic, God will take notice of us. They turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. Oh, brother. Oh, sister. Oh, church. Where did we get the idea except in this late stage of the church, in this lukewarm Laodicean church age. Where, how did it come to be that we thought we could just say, help us, God, and then go on and live the way we were living without showing one bit of brokenness and without doing one thing that requires a sacrifice or without crying out mightily unto God in sackcloth and ashes and repentance and brokenness, 
How did we get the idea that all you have to do is call on God and then God will do it because he's a good God and then we can just keep on with our violence and continue in our sin and continue with our cold hearts. We've made a mess in the church. We let psychology, Christian psychology, seep in, sneak in to the ranks of our church. And today we have now given sinners an excuse to sin, to stay in their sins. You don't find churches crying mightily out to God anymore. You don't even see sinners crying out mightily to God. You don't see brokenness in sackcloth and ashes, and I don't even mean literally the material and the dust. I mean in their hearts being so broken that they feel that they can go no lower so that they must cry out to God mightily. But in the modern church, we have preached such a watered down gospel and we have eliminated the requirements of God for a holy and sanctified life. You do not hear people being called to repentance and brokenness and walking away from their sins. They are given permission to be angry and violent and sinful and lustful because it's just the way we are. But God understands it and he's going to take us to heaven anyway. I'm going to stand here and apologize to this church, whether you think I need to or not. But I am so thankful for the completed work of Christ on Calvary. I know my name is in the Lamb's book of life and I believe that I am eternally secure. But I also believe that if I am saved, I am continuing in the faith. I'm a praying man. I'm a truth-telling man. I read the Bible. I flee the devil. I walk away from sin. I put it away from me. I run from it every day of my life. I don't give myself permission to sin. I am ruthless and merciless with my own body and my own desires. Yes, I'm eternally secure, but I have to live a life of separation and sanctification and holiness and seek the face of God. I don't know when he's coming back, but I've got to live in such a way that if he comes in five minutes, I'll see him face to face. I can stand before you right now and tell you there's no sin in my life. I'm not doing anything that is bothering me or convicting me. I laid it at the foot of the cross and I am walking the walk in the spirit with Jesus Christ. So yes, I feel secure. And yes, I'm happy about my salvation. But I don't give myself excuses to sin. But pastor, you don't understand. What? Don't understand. But this is what we've told people. You came from an abusive family. <laughs> you really have a lot to deal with. You beat your wife because your daddy beat his wife, your mama. Uh, you drank a lot because your daddy drank a lot. It's in your genes. Yes, pastor, I just wrestle with stuff. If you only knew, I came from a bad neighborhood. I come from a terrible background. It's just that way in my culture. Or I was born this way. Now look at me. Look at me. There are no excuses for sin. There is not one excuse that God gives you to live in sin. There isn't one reason, and I mention those things that we always use as excuses, why we continue to abuse our bodies with drugs and alcohol and abuse our eyes with lustful, nasty, vile, filthy things. We continue to live according to the flesh while calling Jesus Lord of our lives 
and then go so far as to say, it's the way I am. Yes, I was born with this. There's only one problem. God sent his only son, the ultimate sacrifice. And that ultimate sacrifice was power enough to break the power of sin on this earth. It was powerful enough to break the control of the devil over the believer's life. It was mighty enough to take you out of darkness and place you into the kingdom of his dear son. You mean to tell me that you believe Jesus died for your sin, but he can't give you deliverance over your sins? No, sir, I don't accept that. Neither does the word of God, neither does the Bible. It's, uh, no, it's, it's no excuse time. It's time to stop feeling better because you went to church on Sunday and uh, then you went out and said, well, I can't help it. This is the way I am. When I, when I get in trouble, I have to drink this and I have to do that. I'm just gonna tell you, I don't talk much about alcohol, but I'm watching it destroy families every day in this church. And I'm watching people lose their walk with God over alcohol. You see, it, alcohol may give you a little relief when you're under pressure and you're tense, but it will never make you more spiritual. You will never consume alcohol and cry out for more of God. It just doesn't work that way. And yet you're being deceived by the fact that the stress in your life requires that you do this. And the more you do it, the more you want to do it and the more you rely upon doing it. And I've come to tell you this morning as boldly and blatantly as I know how, there is not one single excuse for anybody in this world to sin and live in sin, not since he died and rose from the dead and gave all power to you in the name of a risen Jesus. Here's the problem we have and we're not willing to deal with it. God says this. We read it and God says this. Hmm, but I'm doing that. God says, don't do this, but I'm doing it. Now, what am I going to do? How do you rectify that? Either you say, it doesn't really mean that. God didn't really say that, or it was different in the Greek and the Hebrew, or these new modern translations of the Bible, or these modern translations of preachers will tell you that it didn't really mean that, or that these days it doesn't apply to that. So, what you're doing is okay. Here's the problem again. God says, this is wrong. But somebody we love is doing it. Ah. Oh. God says, homosexuality is an abomination. God said that. But somebody we love is involved in it. Mm-hmm. God says that drunkenness will take you to hell. But somebody we love has to have it to make it through the day. God says adultery is sin. But somebody we love is committing adultery. What do you do about it? You have to make a decision. Who's right? And you know, if you've been here for any amount of time, you've heard me say, your children will change your theology. Have I not said that? And I, I've seen it so many times that I believe it more than I've ever believed it before. But in the church, in the modern church, in the watered down church, in the lukewarm church, in the church where Jesus says, I'm knocking at the door and you won't let me in. We've decided that somehow psychologically, and uh, through psychosis and counseling, we can merge what God said with our continued weaknesses and sins and somehow we're going to make it to heaven. No, we're not. No, you're not. I'm here today as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm speaking on his behalf. I'm an ambassador for Christ. And I am telling you right now, God still hates sin. 
He hasn't changed his mind about it. He hates sin so badly that he was willing to give his own son to get rid of it. And for us to continue to live in it, how how can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? For us to count it as a light thing and ignore it and say it's a weakness instead of a sin that will bring damnation of God. We just go right along and we try to balance sin with what we call righteousness. So church is that place where that happens. We go to church, we feel better, we go out into the world, we continue to live like the world, and we forget that God said, if you're of the world, you're not of me. In fact, I want to read these verses of Scripture to you. Now listen, I didn't write this Jesus wrote this. You ready? Beginning with verse number four. In 1 John, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. You hear it? Let nobody trick you. Don't let anybody change this. Let no one deceive you, little children. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as the Lord is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this cause or this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his children remain in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Wow, there it is. That's what this says. And then we look at ourselves and say, I'm not lining up. Or we look at somebody we love and say, they're not lining up. And instead of crawling in a closet and howling to God about their condition or about our condition, instead of putting on sackcloth and sitting in ashes and crying mightily out to God, we just simply say, the Lord is merciful And I heard him say, Jesus is Lord when he was little. I said, Jesus is Lord, so that means I'm saved. No, it doesn't. You are not saved unless you are bearing the fruit of salvation. But pastor, I believe in Jesus. So do the Muslims. So does every cult. So does the devil. He believes more strongly about Jesus than you do. Because the Bible says the devils believe and they tremble. They tremble. They don't start doing all this and skip dancing around when sin is mentioned and the holiness of God is preached. No, they tremble. They are more aware of Jesus than we are. And yet we will excuse people we love. Yea, we will even excuse ourselves saying, I can't fight it, I can't win. And I just want to ask, and I don't know who I'm supposed to be looking right at right now, the camera or the people, I just don't know. But I'm going to ask you a question. Is your fleshly desire more important than going to heaven? But these are my tendencies and uh, my sexuality, it's who I am, it's, it's all this stuff. I want to ask you again, Is your sexuality more important to you? Living in sin and being who you are, is that more important to you than having Jesus welcome you home and declare that you are righteous? Do you mean to tell me, you who are hooked on drugs and hooked on alcohol and hooked on pornography and hooked on adultery, just hooked, 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 and you've given yourself permission, do you mean to tell me that you would rather have that than to have Jesus because the book I'm reading out of says you can't have both. 
You see, it's boiled down to this. You might just have to do what every believer has had to do, including Jesus. You can't just stand there and say, oh, well, I'm trusting him to take me home. No, sir, you have to deny your flesh. Every believer in here and every believer till Jesus comes back has had to win this battle in the inner chamber. They've had to stay on their knees. They've had to cry out to God. They've had to fast and pray every single day to keep victory over the flesh. Even Jesus. Why do you think he spent 40 days and nights without food and water in the wilderness? Because he knew that his flesh would be aroused by Satan's offers. And he did not trust his flesh. So he knew if he didn't go there and die there, he could not fulfill the Father's will. And if you read in Hebrews, Jesus, all the days of his flesh, all the days he was alive, cried unto God with strong and vehement cries and tears, overcoming the flesh. I guess what I'm trying to say, and I don't feel like I've said it yet, this is not a cakewalk. You have to live on your knees. You have to drag your carcass, your sinful flesh, listen to me, every day. You have to put it on a cross every day. Not once a week, but if heaven means anything, if eternal life means anything, that won't be a bother whatsoever. If you know your flesh, it will eventually damn you. It won't be a bother at all to take it into the closet and leave it there every day of your life. So yes, we have to cry out mightily to God. And when God sees our works, when God sees that we mean business enough to fight and give up the flesh and the world, when he sees that we mean business, I tell you the power of God will come into our lives and the disaster that has been appointed, God will turn it around. Brother, every sinner is headed towards disaster. Every half-hearted Christian is headed toward disaster. But if we would repent, cry out, call on God, leave ourselves behind, who knows? God might turn and send the revival, not only to me, but throughout my family, throughout my generations. Listen now, and I'm finished. This is the third week that I've mentioned the churches in Revelation. And he closes every letter to every church with this. He who overcomes. To him who overcomes. Am I making myself clear to the church and to you today? You don't just come to an altar and sign a card. I know that's old-fashioned preaching. You don't just go to a crusade, walk down and sign a card, and have eternal life. No, sir. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the way, you don't get saved by works. You, you get saved by believing on him. But once you get saved, it's time to go to work. And, and you even got to go to battle. You got to put on the whole armor of God every day of your life. Go to battle. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne even as I overcame and I sit with my father on his throne. To him who overcomes, I will let him eat from the tree of the paradise of God. To him who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. To him who overcomes, I will let them eat some of the hidden manna and I will give them a new name written on a white stone. 
To him who overcomes uh, will reign and rule with me as we rule over the nations. Overcome, overcome, overcome. Not slack and lazy and churchy and religious, but on fire for God, willing to suffer anything, give up anything, that Christ may be seen and glorified in me. Stand up with me, please. Preacher, you got me worried. I hope I do. That's why I came to this pulpit. I came up in here to worry somebody. I came up in here. Is that the way to say it? I'm, I stood in here to stir you up. I want you to go to heaven. And I will not stand before Jesus and have him say, those were just speeches. I wanted a word from you. I wanted people to turn. Listen to me, church. Listen to me, those of you viewing. Our time is running out. And you've got to stop giving sin permission to live in your heart. I don't care how much you love your son or your daughter. Sin is sin. And you're not going to win them by pulling them close and saying, I understand we love you anyway. Where is the brokenness? And after you hug them and say, we love you anyway, why wouldn't you go to the closet and slam that door and scream and cry and stomp? I heard a great preacher the other day tell some young pastors, what in the world are you doing? You're reading everybody's material. You're trying to learn how to make a sermon. How much time have you prayed? You're not even learning that prayer is the most important thing you can do in the ministry. All your preaching and all your scripture quoting and everything else is but a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. He said, when I was young, I would go out in the woods and I would scream to the top of my lungs, I will have you. You cannot deny me. I will have you. And then he said, at times I'd pick up rocks and throw it towards heaven and say, just in case you didn't hear me, I'm still here. I want you. I want you. Oh, pastor, that's crazy. It might be time for you to get crazy. If you are sincere about a holy life, because you won't get to heaven without it. Can I get an amen? amen? A holy life. This was the message for you. And now, Father, I have given them what you've given me. And I pray that these words will not just sting or just prick, but I pray that they will stab and enter hearts. And may we become a people who cry out mightily to God. Save that man, that woman, that father, that mother, those children. Save them. Jesus, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Remember, we're not having prayer meeting in the sanctuary tomorrow night. We're praying, but it's not in the sanctuary. See you next time, unless Jesus comes. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.